Coming up, from a Hollywood apology to the new class of inductees into the National Native American Hall of Fame, we'll speak with Sashane Littlefeather and James Parker Shield. Plus, we'll meet the creator behind the all-Native fantasy adventure series, Spirit Rangers. I am Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus more from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 Indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of Indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class Indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. This is the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez. Amarawa Hopa. Thank you for joining us. In September, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures paid tribute to Sashin Littlefeather. Besides honoring her life's work, the Academy issued an apology to Littlefeather decades after she refused to accept an Oscar award on behalf of the actor Marlon Brando. ICT senior editor Diana Hunt spoke to her about her health and her career. First thing I want to know is how is your health? Uh, well, uh, it could be better. <laughs> it could be better, but uh, I'm thankful for what I have. And, uh, you know, I get up every morning with a prayer, lots of gratitude. Um, and uh, in this latitude, you know. All right. I, I wanted to talk to you specifically because the impact that what you did had on indigenous women, indigenous young women and older women and, and what the apology means and what kind of message you think that it sends now? Well, first of all, I never, ever, ever expected to get an apology from the Academy Awards. Uh, this is just something of a shock to me personally, and I never thought anything would ever happen like this in my whole lifetime. So, and it was totally unexpected. I never expected anything like this, ever. And I'm, I'm glad that I'm still alive to receive it. I became a nutritionist, a holistic health nutritionist uh, with a minor in traditional Indian medicine, that's, the, that's herbology. And I worked in that chosen field, went to a lot of different reservations and gave workshops to native people. And uh, that's one of the things I did. Then I became a founder and a board member of the American Indian AIDS Institute in the early 1980s in San Francisco. And of course, I worked in hospice with Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Um, so I did a lot of things that, that held my interest in the health field. And um, it was working with children who had cancer, leukemia. Uh, I don't rarely ever talk about these things. They're very personal, very beautiful to me. Um, but there are many things that meant so much to me. I put a program together called a ropes course uh, with some San Francisco police officers for inner city children who didn't have an opportunity to get out on the wilderness trek and uh, help put that together here in the Bay Area and other such programs. Again, these are just personal things that I did. 
that gave me an opportunity to express my interest. I also was a member of the uh, Kateri Tekethawitha Circle and worked toward her sainthood in Rome that happened in 2012. And uh, I actually went there for her canonization with 1,000 other Native American Indian people uh, during her canonization. And that was also something that I had prayed for for many, many years and uh, was very fortunate to be there. So these are a little bit of my interest uh, during my lifetime. It sounds like you have absolutely no regrets. No, not at all. Um, I promised myself when I was a young person, here's a picture of me when I was wow. young, young and gorgeous back in the day. Yep. Uh, I'm 75 right now. But when I was young and, and gorgeous back in the day, I... Uh, promised myself one thing that I would never be bored <laughs> and I never have been and I, I've been far too busy to be uh, looking to see what my neighbor's doing and, and be jealous or any of that sort of thing and as a matter of fact when other native people or other people do something and they accomplish something I'm more than happy for them because if you're envious of other people, I mean, there's always going to be somebody that's more accomplished than you, that's more gorgeous than you, that's richer than you, that has more things with you. So you're going to wear yourself out being gorgeous and waste all your energy. Just be the best you that you can be. What, what message would you like to send to Indigenous people, but especially Indigenous women today? And, and things have changed, I guess, since 1973 in some ways, and in some ways they probably haven't. Well, the doors are open now for Native Indian people in a way that they were not when I was younger. And uh, I've lived through many, many things. But to see those doors open up little by little by little, it is a dream for me coming true. It didn't have to be me, but the doors are open. And when I see Native women uh, before the screen, uh, acting, producing, directing, uh, boy, it makes my heart just sing. It makes it very full. Uh, I'm so happy to uh, be able to know that this is, this is going on. If I did anything to help in that direction, I am more than gratified. On November 5th, nine outstanding Native Americans will be inducted into the National Native American Hall of Fame. These people have made major contributions in the fields of government, law, publishing, sports, and entertainment. The National Native American Hall of Fame was established by James Parker Shield in 2016. He tells us more about the people and the event. Well, once again, I think we have a slate of stellar individuals, people that have um, made notable accomplishments, uh, not for their own lives, but also that have a great impact on Native America in general. Uh, you know, at the top of the list, you know, uh, we have uh, Governor Bill Anatubby from the Chickasaw Nation and John Echohawk from Native American Rights Fund, Tim Gallego, who uh, founded Indian Country Today and uh, also uh, had Native Sun News. You know, those are three of the, the nine inductees that we have coming in this year. I know you could speak at length about the process, but how does one get inducted into the National Native American Hall of Fame? Well, uh, fortunately, uh, I have a national board of directors who have a lot of experience and knowledge about uh, Indian country in general and the people that uh, were impactful. 
Uh, so we get names from our board, but we also get names from other people. Some of them are just by happenstance. You know, you'll be talking to somebody about the Hall of Fame and they'll throw out a name. And one of the things that I think it's important for people to realize is uh, it's not a popularity contest to get into the Hall of Fame. Uh, you have to be somebody that has uh, achieved uh, greatness or had a great impact on uh, Native America or improving the lives of Native Americans. And so uh, some of those people are well known, uh, some are not so well known. So we have a mixture uh, of both of those kind of people. You know, James, I'm glad you brought that up. Tell us about maybe some of the people in this year's class who aren't so well known and what their accomplish accomplishments are. Well, I think that, uh, you know, the, probably the, you know, I guess you, if you looked at all nine, you would like to think, well, dang, you know, uh, they're, they're all pretty known. Uh, but there's some people that, you know, may not know who Earl Old Person is from the Blackfeet Nation here in Montana. Uh, I do. Uh, I've known Earl for many, many years. And uh, I was just a college student when he used to come down and, and MC our college powwows here in Great Falls. And so I learned a bit about emceeing from Earl, but uh, among the Blackfeet Nation, you know, he was the youngest tribal chairman uh, they had, and, and he served on their tribal council for decades and decades. And he was uh, a long serving uh, council member and chairman a number of times, but not, he not only advocated for the Blackfeet people, but he advocated for you know, Native Americans in general you know, standing up for their rights and making sure the government would adhere to the treaties that they had with tribes. You know, and the other important thing about Earl Person was he was a cultural bearer. You know, he, he, he knew the traditional songs, he knew the ceremonies. And so there was many times when I would see him uh, with his drum group that they called the Rawhide Orchestra. And uh, he and his, his uh, fellow members of that drum group would, uh, would always perform and, and sing songs at different occasions, you know. So I thought that was always one of the neat things about Earl Person was that he was very traditional and that he carried on the culture, he spoke the language, uh, and at the same time, he was a leader in the modern sense. What a gift. Thank you for sharing those stories with me today. You mentioned Tim Gallego earlier in this interview, and of course, Tim Gallego passed away very recently. How are you going to honor him, given that he's now in the spirit world? Well, uh, I've, I've talked with uh, uh, Mrs. Gallego, uh, Jackie, and uh, you know she plans to be there to accept the award and induction on her husband's behalf. Uh, fortunately, uh, Tim was notified uh, before he passed on that he was going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Clara Caulfield at the Cheyenne Voice, who also wrote for the Native Sun News and was a good friend of Tim Gallegos, told me that he was very excited, and very pleased uh, to hear that he was going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. So uh, that's one thing I, I'm very glad happened. Absolutely. And I want to highlight one more person in this year's class, and that's uh, a very famous basketball star. Tell us about her and, uh, you know, how, how excited you are to honor her. Well, since since I, I play a lot of basketball myself, still at an advanced age, uh, she's one of my heroes. Uh, Rinaldi Vicente from the Navajo Nation uh, was, you know, one of those, those natives that, uh, you know, was a one that broke the, the, the barriers and, and, and led the way for Native women in particular uh, to uh, achieve greatness on the basketball court. She played for Arizona State University. And from what I understand, it seemed like every time she played, the, the attendance doubled, you know, in that basketball arena. Uh, she also was the first Native American woman to be uh, in the WNBA. Uh, and she played for the Phoenix Mercury. You know, so we're very excited to have her. But I think the story doesn't end there for her. One of the things that impressed me the most about Rinaldi was that after her playing days were over, she devoted her life to uh, teaching the game to uh, young Native Americans on the reservation. And so she was at a lot of different basketball camps and, and taught a lot of young people coming up. So exciting, definitely. Well, James, thank you so much for being here and for telling us your stories today. 
You betcha. I'll see you at the induction ceremony. Recently, we've seen a number of native-focused shows on streaming services, and now you can add one more to that list. Spirit Rangers is an all-native fantasy adventure series. Carissa Valencia is the creator of the project who says this is a dream come true. Oh my gosh, I this has been a labor of love. Um, I can't wait for everyone to see our hard work. Animation takes a very long time. I've been on the show for about three years now, and... I just can't wait for everyone to see it. all our hard work. I keep saying like we've assembled the native Avengers of Hollywood to work on this. We have like natives at every single department and just like you can feel the energy in the show. And I'm just so excited for everyone to see it. What is Spirit Rangers about? So Spirit Rangers um, follows a modern Native American family. They live and work in a national park. The kids have this secret that they're Spirit Rangers, which means they can transform into their own unique animal. And they go on adventures in their national park that they call home. So it's it's when they transform, not only do they physically transform, but the park that they live in also transforms. So at the risk of sounding like a millennial, it's like when an Instagram filter is over the park. So as soon as they transform, the thunderstorm that you see in the sky as a human is actually a family of thunderbirds in spirit park so we see that that connection to nature is really really important and like everything is alive everything is connected so i'm hoping that you know the next time a kid like kicks a rock or wants to kill a spider they're thinking about how everything is alive and has a purpose and a place and connected to our land Earlier, Carissa, you mentioned that you've uh, compiled what you call the Native Avengers crew to work on this show. Maybe tell us about some of the people behind the scenes who are making it come to life. Yeah, um, I'm particularly proud of our all Native writing staff. That was something I told Netflix I really wanted even when I pitched the show. Um, and that is where like the heart of the series really lies. They took the time to like, you know, we were in a space together where they felt that we could talk about what it was like growing up as a Native kid. What were our challenges? What were we excited about? What was hard about it? What do we wish we saw when we were kids on TV? So they really allowed themselves to be vulnerable and brought their own cultures to the table because Spirit Park acts as like this magical hub where we'll meet California spirits, which is my tribe, the Shumash, but we'll also meet characters who are visiting and passing through the land from other areas. So it was really special that the writing staff could bring their own stories to the table. Um, Joey Clift, who we all know and love, is amazing. And when I wanted to make the family multi-tribal, I obviously went to uh, my tribe to ask for their permission. And Joey offered to ask his tribe and he did a big meeting with his elders and his tribe to ask for their permission. And they said, yes, we're so grateful. And both the Shumash and the Cowlitz have been amazing collaborators on this process. Um, and now the kids are representative of like, not all natives look the same. So when we we're designing the characters, they have different skin tones, different hair colors, different eye colors. So by being able to do that, it's been it's been such a joy to show just like a beautiful native family. So I'm really grateful to Joey for doing that for us. You know, something that really strikes me is that 25 years ago, children turned on the television and they were able to watch, you know, whatever animation was on TV. But nowadays, children turn on streaming services like Netflix. Maybe talk about what those early conversations were like with Netflix and how excited they were to um, maybe work on a project like this. Yeah, I think like this has been a really exciting time because it is long overdue to see our stories. Um, I think they were really excited about the idea that this is perfect for the preschool audience. It's basically like Grimm's fairy tales, but with a native twist. And we have so many of our own stories like that. So it was the perfect place for a preschooler to like literally walk in someone else's shoes or walk in someone else's paws, I guess, like feeling the earth that way, learning about their place that way. So it was an exciting time. When can we actually turn Netflix on and watch this show and how many episodes will it be? <laughs> okay, mark your calendars. October 10th, Indigenous Peoples Day. 20 episodes will be up. Um, they're 11 minutes long. And 
I think it'll just be on like a light switch. 180 countries will have access to spirit rangers. And I'm so, I'm just like so happy that it's on indigenous people's day because that holiday is like uh, often celebrated of like the past and the traumatic past of Columbus. But the fact that spirit rangers is coming out, that's about uh, native families, native youth celebrating our selves here in the modern space like kids are the future so I'm just like really happy that it's aligning with that date because what a great way to celebrate it oh absolutely and will you be hosting a viewing party or how will you be tuning in I hope so I'm hoping to go home to the reservation and watch with um watch with my tribe out there it'll be a really special day and I'll probably cry a bunch (laughs) I can't wait for everyone to see it Well, Chris, I'm so excited that you're here. We only have about 30 seconds left here, but if there's one thing that you want people to know about this project, what is it? This project, while I'm so proud of it being for natives, it's also not for natives too. I'm excited for them to learn about us and we're welcoming them into our world and seeing us exist in the present tense. And I just am really excited and hope it inspires future Native creators and storytellers. I can't wait to see the next generation of what they create next. For the first time, Baycone College in Muskogee, Oklahoma has an athletic director who is a woman. But it's not the first time Tara Cooney Baker has made history. Tara was also the first woman to have her jersey retired by Oglala Lakota College after she scored more than 1,000 career points in her college career. She has been a teacher and basketball coach for 10 years and is currently working on a doctoral degree. Here's more from Tara Cooney Baker. Yes, I came about a year ago. I was actually in Washington State, um, Puyallup. I was working for the Puyallup Tribe uh, Chief Lush High Schools, and I was um, a basketball coach. And I taught fifth grade there. So, you know, made the journey all the way across the country, it felt like. But um, it's been different because um, usually my background is K through 12, but now I'm at the college level. So it's been a little bit of an adjustment. But I do like it. Um, Stepping into the athletic director role has been um, challenging, but I see a lot of, you know, promising students coming, a lot of good stuff coming here to Baycone. So what exactly does an athletic director at Baycone College do? So we help with um, scheduling games um, for all the teams. So at Baycone College, we offer soccer for men's and women's. Um, softball and baseball, and then men's and women's basketball. And then we're just now bringing back cross country. So I help with scheduling. I help um, the coaches kind of oversee them, make sure they're doing what they're supposed to for their athletes. And then just kind of overseeing um, the budgets, you know, preparing the getting this game day stuff ready, basically. So live streaming stats, that kind of stuff, ordering gear. Um, that's about the gist of it. So what exactly goes into scheduling? I mean, I think we see um, most often there are games scheduled, but we don't actually think as spectators what goes behind those decisions. Right. Um, So with scheduling, um, you want to make sure that you're playing, because we are NAI, we're a four-year college, so we are part of the Continental Athletic Conference. And so we, when I schedule games, um, I'm usually making sure that they are, you know, within our league that we're playing. Last year, we played a lot of D2 schools. Um, A couple of times, we played Division I colleges. So, um, you know, that's a big jump for us. So I'm just making sure we're playing teams that are close to us in our conference, you know, on our level. And then, you know, nothing's kind of interfering with each other. and We're not booking our soccer um, and our basketball at the same day because we all kind of help each other here. As I mentioned in my opening, you, um, of course, are a very impressive athlete yourself. How do you think that that has translated into um, becoming an athletic director? Um, I think I understand the game uh, a lot um, better coming from, you know, um, being an athlete and then co- becoming a coach and now into this role. So I understand what the students needs and their feelings, but, um, you know, also, uh, from a kind of a teaching perspective and that kind of stuff, what I need to do so that they could be successful. So I kind of see it from both sides, um, of my upbringing. And now that I'm a, I'm a coach athletic director. So you mentioned earlier that there's some exciting athletes that you're going to be watching. Who exactly are those athletes for my school? Um, we have a couple from the Navajo Nation. They're in Navajo and Creek. They come from Ganado, the McIntosh sisters. They were here last year and um, they're returning for us. So they're they're really fast paced. They move the ball. So I'm excited to watch them. Then we have a couple of girls from Wisconsin. And so um, they work well together also. They're Oneida. And so 
I think just kind of meshing them all together, we kind of have girls from all over the place, some from South Dakota, here in Oklahoma. So it's kind of just seeing it all put together. And then um, last year was kind of a rebuilding year. And this year, I think that they have a better understanding of, you know, how fast paced college level is. So I'm excited to watch them and see how much they they grew. When you learned that you were actually the first female to be tapped as an athletic director, what was your reaction? Um, I was kind of shocked because, I mean, I, I know there's a lot of women that are, you know, um, distinguished and I think could do the role, but I think they've been overlooked a lot. So I was just kind of shocked that I was actually the first woman here to to be an athletic director, but I, I'm glad I could, you know, set the bar and hopefully more women to follow after me. Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned you are a teacher. I mean, what kinds of messages do you send send to children and to young people about, you know, what women can do in a field like this? You know, just a lot of encouragement and telling them, you know, not to give up on their dream. You know, especially a lot of us, we come from uh, the reservation or from poverty, you know, and just trying to break the cycle and um, continue to persevere and uh, don't give up on their dreams. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.